Hello everyone, my name is Demismu and this is my assistant, The Foot, and today we'll talk about Zeno. In the previous video we talked about Parmenides and his idea that all things are one. We discussed how Parmenides argued against the plurality of things, against the existence of change and motion. According to Parmenides, our senses deceive us to think that there is such thing as many things or motion. If we follow the path of truth, as he argued, we will come to the conclusion that there is only the one, which is unchanging and motionless. Zeno was a follower of Parmenides and he went out of his way to argue the point that plurality and motion are in fact illusions brought about by our senses. And he argued this by showing that if we think that plurality and motion exist, then we will end up in paradoxes. These arguments are hence known as Zeno's paradoxes. Let's look at one argument against plurality first. Zeno argues the following. If you think that there are many things, then all of these things must have some size. The warrior is larger than the tortoise. Furthermore, if you believe in many things, you have to accept that these things are composed of parts. Achilles is composed of legs, head, shield, spear and so on. And then all of these parts have their own parts. And so on and so on into infinity. This means that there is an infinity of parts, since all things are infinitely divisible. Now here is the paradox. The ultimate constitutive parts cannot have any size, they have to have zero magnitude. And the reason for this is that if the parts had some size and they were infinite in number, an infinite number of parts of any size, however small, would produce an infinitely large thing. If you have really small pebbles, but you have an infinite number of them, their sum would be infinitely large, regardless how small the pebbles are. So this means that the ultimate parts cannot have any size. But if they have no size, if they have zero magnitude, then an infinite number of parts of zero magnitude would result in a thing of zero magnitude. So basically, if we presuppose a plurality of things and their parts, their sum would be either infinitely small or infinitely large. And this is a paradox. Now this is an example of an argument against plurality. Let's look at Zeno's arguments against motion now. These are the more popular. The first argument against motion, the paradox of motion, is called Achilles and the tortoise. Now imagine these two racing against each other. The tortoise, because it is slower, gets a head start of 100 meters. After the tortoise reaches the 100 meters, Achilles, who is much faster, starts running. Obviously, no matter how much head start the tortoise has, Achilles, who was the fastest warrior in ancient Greece, should easily win the race. But when Achilles reaches the 100 meter, the tortoise is at 100 meter and 10 centimeter. So the tortoise crawled 10 centimeters more in the time that took Achilles to reach the tortoise. When Achilles reaches 100 meters and 10 centimeters, the tortoise is at 100 meters and 11 centimeters. And when Achilles reaches 100 meters and 11 centimeters, the tortoise is at 100 meters, 11 centimeters and 10 millimeters. And so on into infinity. In other words, whenever Achilles catches up to the tortoise, the tortoise already crawled a little bit further. So Achilles will be forced to constantly catch up to the tortoise without ever actually overtaking it. Motion, in other words, is an illusion. Motion presupposes that a thing moving faster could catch up to the thing moving slower. But since reasoning shows us that this is impossible, it is reasonable to conclude that there can be no motion. The second paradox of motion concerns a flying arrow. We can follow the movement of this arrow and observe the clock to look at the time it takes the arrow to complete its motion from this point to this point. If we pause the clock at this moment, we see the arrow standing still. The arrow is occupying this place here. At the next moment, the arrow is standing still and is occupying this place here. And so on and so on. So the movement of the arrow is actually just a collection of these positions in which the arrow is standing still. And since the time it takes the arrow to complete the movement is nothing but an aggregate of these moments, of these nows at which the arrow is standing still, the arrow is never actually moving. It is merely standing still at different places at different moments. Therefore, there is no motion. Now, over the course of history, many solutions to these paradoxes were proposed. And then there were many new questions about the validity of solutions. And there were questions about the validity of Zeno's own reasoning. 
But Zeno's paradoxes are still very popular today because they tend to subvert our common sense understanding of things, they pit reason against our senses. And what is interesting about them is how a completely counterintuitive thesis, such as that all is one and that there is no plurality of motion, suddenly becomes plausible in the face of arguments and paradoxes. In the future videos, we will see this common sense understanding of the world eroding even further. Thank you very much for watching and until next time.